call to worship this morning is from Psalm 93. This is a psalm we sing a lot. God calls His people into worship as a congregation. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O Lord. Let's sing God's praises now. From Psalm 50a. Psalm 50a in your Psalter. That he may judge his people all. Our scripture reading is actually a parallel text to our sermon text this morning. Our scripture reading will be from Luke 13. If you read our text in Matthew in context, you'll see that there's a lot of details that are the same in Luke chapter 13 as what we find in Matthew chapter 7, which is our will be our sermon text this morning. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, I'll read the first five verses and then I'll go down to verse 22 and read through verse 30. Luke chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you not. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Going down to verse 22. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. Randy, can you come lead us in our congregational prayer? Let's sing God's praises now from hymn number three. Hymn number three in your hymnal. Saints triumphantly bow before him, gathered in from every race. Well, I hope by now in our study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that you have come to appreciate the importance of the context of Israel's history and law. And you're getting at both barrels because those working at it from the historical side, and I'm kind of jumping right in the middle here as we continue the series through the book of Matthew. But that's really the crux of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's why so many Christians do not understand really don't grasp what Jesus is talking about as he gives his teaching from the mountain. 
And it's the same problem with the Old Testament. We don't understand Jesus because we don't understand Israel's history and law in the Old Testament. Those things go together. You miss the Old Testament, you're going to miss what Jesus is really communicating to those who listen to his teaching. So this Sermon on the Mount hinges on the law and the prophets. And you can kind of see this in the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. If you go back to chapter 5, you notice that things really get rolling from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Law and kingdom, they go together, and they are the center of what Jesus is pressing in his Sermon on the Mount. And that was the pressing question for Israel in Jesus' day as well. When everyone knew that the time had come for God to fulfill his promises to the prophets about a salvation of Israel. And so we have looked at the exposition of of what Jesus does with the law in the Sermon on the Mount. And he took it from what was bound up in the traditions and teachings of the scribes and Pharisees, basically hidden, basically misrepresented, and Jesus liberates the law as he fulfills it, as he brings it up to its fullest measure. And he unleashes the fullness of the law by applying it to the heart of every detail. So there's something new about the law when Jesus deals with it, but it's not like it's unrecognizable. You can see sort of hints of it in the Old Testament, and Jesus takes those hints and he runs with it and applies it in a way that the people saw as something really new. It astonished them. So even though they championed the law with their lips, Jesus' application revealed a meaning that no one had seen before. Note how our text unfolds what begins with a question of the law and the prophets in Matthew 5.17 sort of comes full circle with what we looked at last time in 7.12 where Jesus sort of wraps up his exposition of the law and says, So in everything do to others what you would have them to do to you, For this sums up the law and the prophets. It's the golden rule. And so the Sermon on the Mount begins with a question about the law and the prophets, and Jesus comes full circle with boiling it all down to how you treat others. That's the essence of the law. According to Jesus, it all boils down to how you treat others. And that makes all of the external regulations and the rituals that were encoded in the law of Moses, which they saw as very important, become obsolete. And that's really why Jesus was so controversial. He was changing something, and it was very controversial to do that. So even the setting here is important. I think if you look at the setting of the uh, Sermon on the Mount regarding the kingdom of God, you'll see that there are interesting reflections from the Old Testament. Jesus took his disciples and followers where? As he began. Up on a mountain. Do you see a pattern from the Old Testament? It's like a new Moses. Moses received God's law at Sinai on top of a mountain. So Jesus is sort of retracing those stories and sort of, and it's very significant. As Matthew records it, Jesus is presented as a new Moses receiving the made new law on a mountain and delivering it to true Israel once again. So the Sermon on the Mount could be really looked at as a new Sinai event. And what's interesting about this story in Matthew is we keep going, we're going to see that Jesus sort of becomes 
bound up in lots of stories of the Old Testament, and they work sequentially. He's going to get to the, ter- to the time of Joshua when he starts sending out his disciples. He gives them a ministry and he sends them out. It's like Joshua. And we're going to see how that story with Jesus basically recapitulates all of the Old Testament, showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So Jesus is the new Moses, God's prophet, ordained to lead Israel out of captivity and bondage. And just to make the point clear, Matthew records how the people responded at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse 28 of chapter 7. This is Matthew simply recording of what he saw, how the people responded. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. What were the teachers of the law doing in this day? They simply tried to apply the law of Moses. And we've seen the debates between the rabbis, the Hillel school, the Shammai school. What are they doing? They are casuists. That's an old word for sort of applying something working within the context of something to apply it in a relevant way. They were working under the authority of the established law, yet Jesus was different. He spoke with his own authority to republish, or I would prefer reform, the law in light of the new Israel being formed through him. And we see this elsewhere in the scriptures where we see that Jesus claims someone greater than Moses is here. You see the contrast all through the book of Hebrews as well. So that's what Jesus' authority signified, and the people were astonished. Matthew records that even the people were amazed that he could come and give his own authoritative approach to the law of Moses. They had never seen anything like that. So this context of Moses and Sinai is confirmed in another profound way, another way that we miss very easily. In the very next thing that Jesus says after he concludes his giving of the law to Israel, the new Israel, which is our sermon text in verse 13 of chapter 7, only two verses today, we read Jesus' continuation right after he sums up the law and the prophets. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Two roads. And the way this text presents it, it gets a little lost in the English translation, is that they go different ways. One has a destination that direction, one has a destination in that direction. The wide way goes to destruction, to death, and the narrow gate goes to life, And the number that find that narrow gate will be few. Life and death. Does that sound a little bit more familiar from the Old Testament? What did Moses do when he gave the law a second time in Deuteronomy? What does Moses do? At the very conclusion of Deuteronomy, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And And the Hebrews who who loved their law, would understand what Jesus is doing. When he puts two ways in front of them, he is an echo of Deuteronomy chapter 30. After Moses offers the law a second time, we read the offer of life and death in Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live 
and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The heavens and the earth are the people of Israel. They are going to be witnesses against themselves if they break the covenant. So the structure of Deuteronomy goes with the second giving of the law, and then after that, Moses goes right into two ways. The way of life, the way of death. And we see the same thing with Jesus. As he finishes up his exposition of the law, he goes right into the two ways. Destruction and life. It's an echo of Deuteronomy. Now we'll get to the proper meaning of this actual this statement in a moment, but I first want to emphasize what is too often overlooked. We just don't understand that Jesus is following the pattern of the Old Testament. We just don't understand that. And all kinds of problems arise in the church when we miss that. Now what's fascinating is that the choice between life and death is offered not only through the law of Moses, but also at another crucial time in Israel's history. And Bo's been working through that time in Israel's history. This offer of life and death is not just something that was in the law, it's also something that's summed up in the prophets, represented specifically by Jeremiah. Turn with me to Jeremiah, chapter 21. And what's neat about this is it's not just the law that Jesus is echoing, he's also echoing the prophets as well. Jeremiah 21, speaking of the time right before Israel is facing its judgment by the hand of the Babylonians, what does the prophet do? Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 8. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says, see, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, and plague, but whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. He will escape with his life. I have determined to do to this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon and he will destroy it with fire. Sound familiar? There's some context for you. So it's not just the law that Jesus is echoing. He's echoing the law and the prophets when he places two ways in front of the people. The way of destruction, the way of death. And it would be very profoundly striking to those who understood the Old Testament. So along comes Jesus in the vein of the law and the prophets and he offers Israel a choice between two ways. The way that leads to death and the way that leads to life. The wide road that the masses travel or the narrow gate that few find. Jesus is throwing it down in front of them. And the context is extremely important because it puts the exclamation point on the parallels between Sinai for Old Covenant Israel and the Sermon on the Mount for New Covenant Israel. Now what happens if you open the Bible to Matthew chapter 7 and you just read this without knowing any of that history? What happens? Well, no, actually, you get that famous song to put ACDC on the map. Highway to Hell, right? Right? Da, 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 da. It's that catchy tune that made ACDC famous. You get culturally ACDC. I'm on a highway to hell. And just like ACDC, most Christians dehistoricize Jesus here and make his statement a universal declaration about the gospel throughout human history. See, ACDC got it from them. I did an interesting experiment this, this last week. I listened to to a a typical rock station, and I listened with the point of finding out how many biblical phrases 
and cliches and references I could hear in the radio. You should do that sometime. It's very interesting. I counted about six in six hours. About once an hour on a rock station out of Bozeman, they were using biblical phrases. Fascinating. That's how much culture is out there from Christian ideas. Now, I'm not saying that they always used the phrases properly, and sometimes it was just inert, sort of meaningless. But that's fascinating. So you take this out of context, you get ACDC's Highway to Hell, which actually comes from Christians who take it out of context and have their own teaching, they dehistoricized from Jesus' context. It's a good example of how cultural screw-up things is a result from bad Christian theology. Just a a good little example. It happens all over the place. Well, what happens when you dehistoricize Jesus and make his statement a universal declaration about the gospel throughout all human history? Well, you get things like this from my commentary, and these are just the best ones. One commentary says, Such imagery lends itself to a preacher's elaboration in terms of the need to fight one's way through the thoughtlessness, contented crowd on the broad road in order to make a decisive break by going through the gate of commitment to discipleship and undertake the hard uphill struggle of the road to heaven. If that's what Christianity is about, I'd rather sing ACDC. It's more relevant to this world. Here's another example. How about this one? Matthew's Jesus does not seem to envisage the general conversion of society. Those on the road to life are only those few who have found it. Where's that coming from? The idea that Jesus is talking about all of history and all of humanity. Ripped right out of context. And that's how you get fundamentalism. Right? Fundamentalism is ripped right out of context. Taking Jesus as he, from the entire situation and the cultural issues that he was dealing with, to make it universal and dealing with all human history and world history. And that's how you get dispensationalism that sees the world as predestined to be dominated by unbelievers and evil till the end. That's what Jesus says, if you take that approach. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. And we are the few. Right? That's how it works. That's what happens when you dehistoricize Jesus and rip him out of context the context specifically of covenant Israel. Yeah. And then it becomes even fewer and fewer, and the few of us, who are the few, picking apart the bad few. And it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And I'll say that if you reject a covenant context to Scripture, you will have no choice but to believe the nonsense of fundamentalism and dispensationalism if you take Jesus seriously. But Jesus knew his ministry would not be successful in large numbers. The question is, what context is he speaking from? Another place where we see Jesus predicting the wholesale rejection of the gospel is in Luke 18. Turn with me to Luke 18. It's sort of a related concept. Luke 18 says in verse 6, And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Anyone guess what the Greek word for earth is in that passage? You guys know. How do Christians read that? This is the second coming at the end of planet Earth, right? And when he comes back, there's just going to be total abdication, total meltdown, total rejection of the gospel. But 
The Greek word is gi, which is land. When he comes back to the land in judgment as the son of man, will he find faith on earth? And the assumed answer is no. Israel is a dead corpse. Their spiritual deadness is heading toward totality with only the remnant, the few, choosing to embrace the Messiah through the narrow gate. And Paul goes on to say that the salvation of this remnant, this elect, is the salvation of all Israel. I'll consider Matthew 22. We'll get there in due time. It may be a while. Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. For many are invited, but few are chosen. That's in the context of the parable of the wedding banquet. And this is where it gets sticky. Because the traditional doctrine of election is directly related to Jesus' teaching of the narrow gate. Election and the narrow gate are one and the same teaching. And Paul continues with this doctrine of election that Jesus began. And so I'll say it makes no logical sense to apply Jesus' teaching on the broad way to destruction and the few who find the narrow gate within a covenant context and then turn right around and apply election, the chosen, the few, into a worldwide context. You've just switched gears. The elect are chosen within the context of Israel, and Matthew records that all the elect would be gathered in Jesus' generation according to Matthew 24, 31. And if you read the Old Testament background behind that promise, where God's going to send his angels to the four winds to gather his elect, that is a promise to Israel. You can read about that promise in Zechariah 9. So context, the elect has a context. So as just as an aside, I say let the reformed world, which we all are familiar with, argue about seeing the covenant through election or see elect, seeing election through the covenant. That's the big argument now in the reformed world. How do you do that? But that debate is insolvable. Because the whole debate is based on the idea of the elect being of all humanity for all human history. It's based on wrong assumptions that dehistoricize Jesus' teaching, that dehistoricize what Paul was teaching. And the, t- the crazy thing about it is that nobody, from Jesus to Paul to Peter and James, nobody was working with that context when they're writing about the elect. They're working in the context of Israel. What about God's promises to Israel? Those were the issues. So by now you're probably thinking, how we should apply this text if we live in a different context than Jesus' world of Old Covenant Israel during the last days of the Old Covenant age. How do you apply this? Well, my answer very simply is, it doesn't apply. Jesus' teaching does not apply to the New Covenant world in Christ because everyone in the New Covenant world enjoys life through covenant union to God through Jesus And thanks to the power of the gospel, there are multitudes here. In the new covenant, there are multitudes here. That's the power of the gospel. There is no sorting out of Israel into those who are headed to Gehenna and those who are going to reach life because the life has come to Israel. It's a little bit different The new covenant gives life to all who abide in it and Israel is the true nation and the true empire on earth. So the question isn't about two ways in our day like it was in Jesus' day where they were all heading toward national destruction. The question is, are we in covenant union with God through Christ and therefore members of true Israel? It's a different question because the story has moved on. And that's a difficult concept for us to take because we're so used to making the Bible out to be a spiritual handbook 
or spiritual manual, rather than the historical narrative of God's triumph in history. Two totally different approaches. And you have to remember that in Jesus' world, they believed they were saved by virtue of their physical descent from Abraham. That belief, and we, saw, we see this running up into Jesus even among his own disciples, that belief would be their undoing. The crowds marched happily to their own slaughter for home and country. That's what happened in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. The masses went to defend home and country and they were destroyed. Save the few who found the narrow gate in Christ and went the other way. Just like Jesus had told them, run away. So our challenge is not to be one of the few. And and I'll say that this misunderstanding about the turn and burn passages has been destructive to the kingdom of God in America for generations. Because it's not the gospel. Turn or burn was the message to covenant-breaking Israel who faced God's judgment as a people. And American Christians, particularly with fundamentalism, have shot themselves in the foot because they don't understand the context of what Jesus was talking about. Our challenge is not to be one of the few. Our challenge is to be one of the great many who live in light of the resurrection life given to Israel through Messiah. The story has moved on because the kingdom has come. Live in that kingdom with all of God's saints. Enjoy eternal life and bring glory to your Father in heaven as you live by the law of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you and praise you this morning, as your people who have been set apart as your priests to the world around us. You have given us your word and the word has become flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the great, mighty things that you have done in our history and heritage as true Israel. We thank you for the great and mighty things that you are doing in our day around the world, even things that we do not see. We see your spirit moving among our families. We see our, our, our children growing up in the faith and becoming, taking their place in the kingdom of God. We thank you and praise you for the work that you are doing among us. We just pray that you bless our fellowship and our friendship here as we engage in the ministry work that, that you have for each one of us, the places that you have placed us use our talents and our skills and our endeavors for your glory. We pray all these things in